Hi, this is the second part of the video about web communication protocols. If you missed the previous part where we discussed REST, there will be a link to it somewhere here. I will also add it to the description. Today we will discuss GraphQL and RPC approaches, gRPC and tRPC. What is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language and runtime for APIs. Simply put, it allows you to query the server for specific data you need and receive only that data in response, rather than a fixed set of data as with traditional REST approach. With GraphQL, clients can specify the data structure they want and the server responds with just that data. This can be more efficient than REST because it eliminates over- and underfetching. Let's look at the advantages of GraphQL. Reduced resource consumption. We get only the data we need in a single query. The problem of under- and overfetching is solved. Usability. We don't need to memorize hundreds of endpoints and parameters. We have only one and we just have to describe what exactly we need. Static analysis. GraphQL is schema-based, so we always know exactly what we got from the backend and we don't need to validate responses. Automatically generated documentation solves the problem of our data documentation and reach the link. GraphQL solves some problem of REST but also has its own trade-offs. The first one is learning curve. GraphQL is a relatively new approach compared to REST and some developers may not be familiar with the technology or best practices. For us, it means that we need additional resources to implement and maintain it. Boilerplate and bundle size. GraphQL code, especially with frameworks such as Apollo, requires more code than other options, resulting in a larger bundle size as well. Network level cache. GraphQL is typically used via a POST request to a single endpoint, so we lose browser caching. Security issues. GraphQL API is vulnerable to denial of service attacks due to its flexible nature. And it has more complex implementation on the backend side. It is much more difficult to create a query to the database that is both performant and flexible. Let's look at some problems of GraphQL to understand how they can affect our application and how we can solve them. The first problem is building queries on the backend side. GraphQL is more difficult to implement on the backend side because the backend developers have to solve the n plus one problem when building queries to the database. To understand why it is a problem, let's look how it works with dedicated endpoints. Perhaps front-end developers can configure it but they cannot request data that is not implied to be requested. In such cases, backend developers can request all data in one request to the database. Backend developers can optimize fetching data because all requirements are known in advance. However, endpoints are not flexible. We cannot query more or less data that the endpoint provides. Now let's look how it works in the case with GraphQL. For example, the client requests an article by ID with many fields and comments. Next time, a client requests only comments. And finally, the client requests only a user. As you remember, all these requests are going through the single endpoint. In other words, backend developers cannot, for the first case, do a single request to the database because requests like the second or third one are also possible. Why is that a problem? Backend developers cannot predict which data will be requested. Therefore, they cannot optimize data fetching as in case with dedicated endpoints. When we are using REST, the situation is different. We have static or dedicated endpoints. In the case with REST, this request would be represented by three different endpoints. Get article, get comment, and get user. Flexibility on the client side that GraphQL gives us leads to insufficient data fetching on the backend side. Why is it a problem for us as front-end developers? There are two possible scenarios. If the problem will not be solved, it means slowing down of handling requests and as a result a worse user experience. And the second scenario, if backend developers will be able to manage such a problem, it requires additional resources to solve. We should understand that implementing GraphQL is not free. So how we can solve it? We can use batching. 
we differ resolving to a later stage when you have all the necessary data to perform a budget query. Budget query is a group of queries that are made in one SQL request. Let's see how it works. For example, the client requests the same data, an article with a list of comments. In the first case, without optimization, we have to make free requests to the database. Now let's look at the same request, but with botching. In such case, we do not immediately make a request to the database. Instead, we wait until all needed data about the request will be received. And only when we got all information and definitely know what we have to fetch, we do a single request to the database. The next problem with GraphQL is possible security issues. When the GraphQL is public, someone will be able to do a very deeply nested request. Such requests, especially if run in parallel, can slow down the CPU or simply crush the application. This type of attack is called a denial of service. Again, the problem is related to the flexible nature of GraphQL. In the case with REST, we just cannot face such a problem because each endpoint is static and returns only the predefined set of data. So how we can solve it? We simply can avoid using GraphQL for third-party APIs. Instead, we can use REST. REST endpoints are not flexible, but they are designed to be cheap in terms of resources. We can use quotas to limit deep requests and pagination to limit the amount of data. For example, the YouTube API uses quotas to limit the data requested. Or we can apply throttling. In other words, we can doesn't allow users to send too frequent requests. The next problem is network level caching, or rather the lack of it. GraphQL is protocol independent, but mostly it is used over HTTP. GraphQL with HTTP is often used through a single post endpoint, which makes caching at the network level difficult. Let's think how it works with REST. We have an endpoint which is determined by the method and URL. We can use this data as a unique identifier and bind a response to such a request. In the case of GraphQL, it is not possible because we use only the one POST method and a single endpoint. Therefore, for the server, all requests look the same. A way to solve it is, for example, using persisted queries, which are offered by Apollo Server, one of the GraphQL servers. Let's see how it works. Client sends both the query string and hash. Server persists the query string and hash. Server executes the query and returns the result. After some time, client sends the hash of the query string to execute. Server finds the persisted query string and returns the result. We do not need an additional request to the database, which improves the performance of the application. We discussed browser caching for REST. For GraphQL, it will not work because of the reasons that we discussed earlier. However, there are many solutions to implement client-side caching for GraphQL. Let's look at cases where GraphQL may be very useful. Loosely coupled backend and frontend teams. When the frontend and backend are represented by a single full-stack team or the frontend and backend teams work closely together, the flexibility that GraphQL gives us may not be necessary because we can always customize the endpoint to our needs. The opposite is also true. The ultimate example of this is a public API. When backend teams create an API, they cannot predict who will use such API and how. It may look like GraphQL is more preferable for a public API than REST. However, not all customers want to use GraphQL, so REST remains the most distributed solution for public APIs. Multiple clients. When an API server has multiple clients, flexibility is very important. We cannot adjust the API to be convenient for all clients. Therefore, using the most flexible solution is advisable. Mobile clients. While on the desktop, under- and overfetching may not be as such a big deal due to unlimited and fast internet connection, on mobile phones it may become a problem. If we know that a significant part of our customers are using our application from mobile phones, we should consider GraphQL as an option. And applications with complex data relationships. It is difficult to derive clear criteria for what a complex data relationship means, but when you start to feel that using the API becomes hard 
and you need to make many requests to receive the data or often ask the backend team to adjust endpoints, it might be a signal that GraphQL implementation would be beneficial. Now let's look at cases when we possibly should choose something else. Simple API. Again, it's hard to determine what is simple and what is not. However, if the API can be designed mostly within the crude paradigm and over and under fetching is not too critical, we possibly should stop at rest, because GraphQL just adds extra complexity. Limited resources. GraphQL requires additional knowledge to implement and maintain, so it is not the cheapest solution in terms of resources. If we need to work with files or other binary data, GraphQL was designed for type of data. Binary data can only be passed as a base64 string. This increases the size of the file and we can transfer a file larger than 380 megabytes. Conflict-free replicated data types for example, Google Docs or Figma and other collaboration tools. GraphQL was not designed to solve such problems. User authentication. Authentication includes redirects, cookies, HTTP headers. All of these things are inconsistent with GraphQL, which was designed to be protocol agnostic. We usually just don't need types for authentication because the request contains only two fields, login and password. Server-to-server -server communication. Such types of communications require high speed, low memory, and traffic consumption. gRPC and protobuf are much more efficient in such cases. And streaming video and audio. Streaming as well as file transfers do not benefit from GraphQL features. The next thing we will discuss is RPC. Before we begin, we have to understand what RPC is. RPC, or Remote Procedure Call, is a communication pattern that allows client applications to call procedures or functions on a remote server. RPC is an umbrella term that refers to the concept of remote procedure calls. It does not define a specific protocol and different implementations may use different communications protocols. To make things simpler, let's clarify the main difference between REST and RPC. REST describes entities while RPC describes actions or functions. For example, in REST, we will do get users to get the users, and in RPC, we will perform get users to do the same thing. We will discuss two implementations, gRPC and tRPC. gRPC uses protobuf as an underlying protocol. It is a programming language independent and usually used to establish server-to-server -server communications. tRPC follows RPC principles as well, but relates to other features, which is quite opposite to gRPC. tRPC uses JSON RPC. It is built on TypeScript and doesn't imply using other languages. And it's mostly used to establish client-to-server communications. So, to our discussion, tRPC is more important because it is more obvious alternative to REST and GraphQL. But we will also look at gRPC. Before we jump to a particular implementation, let's discuss what the RPC approaches can give us compared to REST. RPC may give us some benefits, but it's not familiar to many developers as REST and it's not flexible as GraphQL. We should consider RPC when our frontend and backend teams work together or if it's a single team of full-stack developers. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of RPC compared to REST. It improves performance in case with gRPC, improves reliability for both gRPC and tRPC, makes the API more convenient, and reduces latency if we use gRPC. The price of these advantages is a lack of flexibility. However, if our API is not used by other teams, we don't need this flexibility. Lack of flexibility makes RPC is a poor choice for public APIs. Now let's look at a particular implementation of RPC, gRPC. gRPC, or a Google RPC, is a specific implementation of RPC developed by Google. It defines a protocol that uses HTTP2 as a transport protocol and protocol buffer for data serialization. Advantages of such protocol gRPC uses protobuf instead of JSON and HTTP2, which gives it better performance gRPC provides strong typing and validation, and it allows for both client-side and server-side code generation. gRPC also has disadvantages. 
It is mostly unfamiliar to front-end developers, therefore requires additional time to learn. Debugging is more difficult, because protobuf is not a human-readable format, as JSON, for example. gRPC is not supported by browsers, because it requires access to low-level HTTP2 elements. We need additional resources to make it workable. And it struggles with underfetching. We cannot add fields and entities to the response. Before we jump to the use cases, there is a question. How can we use gRPC in the browser if it's not supported? We can do that, but not natively. We need a proxy between the client and the server. Let's see how it works. On the client, we set up a gRPC client. Such a client sends a request to the gRPC web proxy by using HTTP 1 or HTTP 2. Such proxy is needed to transfer requests from the server to the HTTP 2 and send it to the origin gRPC backend. Such proxy is needed to transfer requests from the server to the HTTP 2 and send it to the origin gRPC backend. So, as we can see, using gRPC in the browser is possible, but difficult. That's one of the reasons why gRPC is not widely distributed for client-server communications. Now let's talk about use and anti-use cases. We should use gRPC for communications between microservices. gRPC was designed for these types of interactions. It provides better performance and smaller message sizes. We can consider gRPC for client-server communication when we have to deal with high data loads and high data transfer speed is critical. Next, let's look at cases when we possibly shouldn't use gRPC. For public API, we discussed it earlier why it's not a better choice. REST or GraphQL should be used instead. Most of the client-server oriented APIs. gRPC can be used for such type of interactions technically. But it doesn't mean that it should. When we begin to use a solution for cases for which such a solution was not designed, we may struggle with many unpredictable challenges, from lack of documentation, examples, community support, to problems with infrastructure. So we have to think twice before implementing gRPC for such types of communications. The next candidate is gRPC. TRPC or TypeScript RPC is one implementation of RPC designed for TypeScript monorepos. TRPC allows us to facilitate client-server interactions. We do not think about implementation details as we do with the rest. Which verbs to use for an operation, how to define a URL, etc. We simply call the functions and TRPC does the rest of the work. Advantages of TRPC include shared types between frontend and backend, full static type safety and autocomplete on the client for inputs, outputs and errors. And it's easy to develop and maintain. It doesn't require additional infrastructure like gRPC or learning new query language like GraphQL. gRPC also has trade-offs. The first one is that TypeScript is required. Both the client and server must use TypeScript. And underfetching is still here. We cannot add fields and entities to the response. You might think that using gRPC is not very beneficial, like for example GraphQL or gRPC. Sometimes that's true. gRPC is simpler. It doesn't provide other protocols for transferring data or new query languages. However, the costs of implementing gRPC are also much lower as well. We can think of gRPC as a wrapper which hides all complexities of communications between client and server and provides a type-safe interface for interacting with the server. Let's look at the schema. For example, we want to receive a list of users. From the client perspective, we do two things. Call a method of gRPC and receive the data. Did you notice how it's simpler in comparison with REST, for example? gRPC is responsible for transferring data to the server and receiving a response. The backend team is responsible for preparing data for the client. There is an important thing. gRPC doesn't do runtime validation. It works with TypeScript types. As you may know, TypeScript doesn't exist in the runtime. It disappears after the build process. So gRPC simply allows us to share TypeScript contracts between the client and the server. We still can use any keyword and crush our application. However, gRPC does an important thing. Because contracts are shared, we do not need to care about their updating. 
in case if we use types correctly and do not use things like the any keyword. So it's a very cheap way to increase the reliability of the application. Let's see when we should use tRPC and where we shouldn't. The perfect scenario for tRPC is TypeScript monorepositories. It doesn't mean that in other case it's not useful. The only requirement is both the client and server must use TypeScript. However, as the client and server become far from each other, the convenience of using tRPC deteriorates. Now let's see the cases when we possibly use something else. The first one is public API. tRPC binds us to the TypeScript, which is not very flexible and so may not be suitable for a client that does not use TypeScript. REST or GraphQL should be used instead. And complex responses. When we are working with complex structures and multiple entities, it might be worth using GraphQL instead. Simple API. For simple API, the tRPC typing system will not be very convenient and REST should be used instead. There are many applications when even using TypeScript would be overhead. And if high efficiency is important, tRPC does not offer speed advantages. When it is very important, gRPC should be considered. We mentioned that underfetching is a problem for gRPC and tRPC as well, because procedures are static and cannot be adjusted to the client's needs. So why is overfetching is not a problem? For gRPC, we can use field mask. Field mask is a set of symbolic field path. For example, article.outer.name returns the name of the article's author. We can use field mask to fetch only required fields. For tRPC, we can pass the required fields as a function parameter, or we can add an additional method to return different set of fields. You may ask why we cannot do the same for REST. We also can put requested fields in the URL. Yes, we can, but we may run into URL length limitations, and we will not be able to use body because GET requests don't allow you to use body to pass data. We have finished the second part. In the next video, we will summarize everything that we have learned and look at the couple of real-life examples to consolidate our knowledge. Thank you for watching.